I think you probably witnessed this too, is that we start to feel like the egg and the sperm. That's it. And we start talking like that. You know, how many eggs do we get? Fertilized, day what, day two? And no wonder that we sort of lose our identity there and things feel very clinical all of a sudden. And the intimacy part of that is really kind of pushed down. Like you said, now we're just the baby making machine with help from these people. And, you know, we're sharing that experience in a not so intimate way, not the way that we thought this was going to unfold. Infertility can impact every aspect of your life, from your schedules to career to family time, friendships, and especially your relationship with your partner. Depending on how much you share, your partner may be the only person that truly knows what you're going through. This can lead to stress and strain in the relationship. Here to discuss the impact of infertility on intimacy is infertility and grief coach Chiemi Rajamahendran. Chiemi, welcome to Baby or Bust. Thanks so much, Laura. I'm curious, in your experience as a fertility coach, how have you seen infertility impact a couple's relationship? I love that question so much. Now I think we're talking more too about touching on the mental side of it, right? The mental health. I really loved seeing couples come in together to chat about that. Predominantly, I used to work with just people, I would say 95% women. And now I get to see so many more couples sitting down together. And I think to the approach, it's very much not sort of let's sit down for therapy and talk about feelings. <laughs> Everyone's going to run for the hills. It was ve- It's very much let's check in. How is everybody doing? How can we bridge harder conversations and just hear about you know your experience as the supporter versus the physical body person going through all the treatment i.e the woman right so it's it's really nice to just have make space for both stories yeah and as far as why it happens and why it's so stressful i can speak to my own experience going through infertility you know, I know better, but my heart really felt like it was my fault. Like here I am a fertility doctor. I should know how to get pregnant. And I wanted to kind of not burden my husband with all the kind of ins and outs. It's kind of like, I got this, you know, like I'll, I'll let you know if I need anything. And looking back on that, that really was a mistake because when I did need him, he really didn't know what was going on. Have you ever seen that in any of your patients? I have, and I can relate to that myself. <laughs> I relate to that on so many levels because I feel like our work hats sometimes do get in the way, right? It adds that extra pressure of, I know all of the stuff up here and the logistical side and the facts and all of that. And it's hard to also step back and just give ourselves the grace to say, but this is unique to me, right? And this is such a new experience. And it's okay to also just not utilize all the tools that we know. So yeah, I absolutely relate to that personally. I like to start out with this is the physical body experience. And I I like to just make people really see that the woman doesn't have the luxury really of detaching from that so much as someone that's not gone through the physical part of it and the, you know, just literally the recovery of that, the procedures and all of the medical side. So that's where I like to start. There really is typically one person who's carrying that physical load and the other person who is trying to be that support. And I just imagine that there's so many emotions that go along with that. I had a patient just this week who the male partner wanted to just have a little quick chat with me and just said, you know, I just don't know how to support her. Like she's just in there crying all the time. You know, she had a miscarriage last month. I want to support her. And she's angry at me. She's angry at me because I'm not the one. If I could do this, he mm-hmm. said to me, if, he's like, I would, I would take the shots. I would, you know, carry the baby. I would have the miscarriage. If I could, I would, but I can't. And I can't break through and try to show that support. Have you ever seen that in couples that you're helping? Yeah. I don't think I've ever had one family that hasn't gone through that because it's such a normal, healthy dynamic. No matter how great your relationship is, you know, how wonderful your partnership is and that equity and communication, it's still, we kind of, there's a scale of resentment on one side and guilt on the other side. And we sort of tip into mm-hmm. both sides. And that's why it's it's so wonderful when we can both just think about having that awareness. 
you know, of I'm going through all of this and he's going to go play golf now. Great. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, that really speaks to that. Resentment is such a good cue for what am I not leaning into for myself? Mm-hmm. Where is that showing up where I feel like I'm self-sacrificing or I'm doing all the things but don't have the the bridge there to really comfort myself or add something support or whatever it is. So that's something we like to look at is I like using anger or resentment as really great signposts to something better, something else. So I love hearing you try to clarify the difference between guilt and resentment and walking through your clients and couples that are really having a difficult time with fertility treatments. So how would you talk to that couple that is one partner is really frustrated that the other one is going out and playing golf and going out with the buddies all the time. How do you help them through that conflict? It would be really, you know, it's different if it's one-on-one. And sometimes we do that. We'll have a one-on-one session and then circle back and meet together and talk about, you know, the communication there and, and that space as a couple. But I would really like to dig into what she's feeling not just the reaction of that behavior. Recently, I I sat down with a couple who had this really similar dynamic. When she really dug into sort of what that feeling was, she realized that she was not feeling supported in other areas. So of course, your one anchor, the one person that you're really leaning on has now sort of left and that feels like abandonment all of a sudden. So recognizing that was really important. And that got her to think about, yeah, where, why have I maybe shut down? Maybe I need to reach out to community a bit more or my sister that called and I haven't answered. So kind of checking in to see where she might have shut down support and community spaces that she used to have. So we realized that and we realized that probably reaching out to, to someone to chat to obviously was a huge step in that. That's great. And then can you say something about how when we first started talking about it, you said how you can actually learn from that negative emotion and it can be a signal to something positive. Can you say that again? I just think that is such a Mm. wonderful learning point. You know, for this couple that's sitting in front of you and she's mad that her because her husband is going to play golf all the time. You seem to have said, like, hey, I will talk to the couple about how, like, learn from that negative emotion. It can be a signal for something positive. That was so great. I love thinking of, you know, emotions as neither a negative one or a positive one. They're just feelings. They're just emotions we're having. And that's really powerful when we start to think about the reactionary behavior that we might be reacting to. Because I'm just reacting to your behavior, you're reacting to mine. And deeper than that, we can look at what is this really signposting me to? Usually, it's at the end of the day, we'll say, well, actually, I was, you know, that really bothered me that you left because I felt alone. I felt abandoned and sort of rejected. And that's such a bridge to a good conversation about why that is, you know, what's going on there. So you're teaching your clients that emotions, no matter good or bad, they can be a signal to kind of learning more about how to help each other with that relationship and kind of learn what what they need to ask for. Yes, yes. And I love that the guilt one teaches us a lot about ourself and you know, so sometimes that same couple actually we were chatting about, so, you know, the other side of the spectrum of when you do lean in to what you need and all of a sudden it feels a bit uncomfortable because now, you know, you're choosing you and you're starting to think about what do I want a sense of comfort and support? And surprisingly, that is a really hard question for most people, right? The relationship they have with vulnerability, asking for help, and just really choosing, you know, your needs in that moment is so important. I worry the most about the patients that are just like totally goal driven, you know, success oriented. Just tell me what to do. Tell me how to get to that finish line, which is a positive pregnancy test and then a baby. And just like, don't even talk about the you know, gushy stuff. Like, I don't even want to talk about my feelings because I I bring it up in every conversation. Like, hey, I'm really great with the medical piece. And I know that if you have blocked fallopian tubes, you know, these are the options for you to have your baby. But, you know, we cannot ignore the mental health piece and the emotional piece of this. And when I 
get shut down. Because I, I mean, I won't go there if patients don't want to go there. But then it's usually like if that first IUI doesn't work, that second embryo transfer doesn't work, they're just like are crumbling. And I'm just like, okay, like, let's talk about it now. Like, like this doesn't mean that you're a failure. This means like, let's figure out how to get your support because yes. it is just not black and white. It's not all or nothing. This is not all physical. It's not all mental. It's just all intertwined. I love that example because it really speaks to, I think the we you know, we use the word journey for a reason. And a lot of people here, they are maybe married a few years in and all of a sudden their new identity is this it's everything fertility it's every it's doctors it's procedures it's tests and so i always remind clients that this is you're not supposed to know what to do here you're not supposed to know how to feel you've never done this before totally new totally left field curveball you know nobody planned that so just kind of sitting in that reality makes us shift hats a little bit because if we stay a lot in the facts and we like to think that fact A and plus B equals how we're supposed to feel. And sometimes we have to put that aside and just say, you know what, these feelings don't make sense, but this is what's coming up. For a lot of our young couples and patients that we share, this is the first true challenge that they've ever faced, maybe even individually, but certainly as a couple. And our expectation is that it's going to be easy to start your family when and if you're ready, because that's what we were taught in health class in middle school. And when it's not, it just starts to get more and more difficult. You see your other friends, you know, surpassing your goals. Maybe you guys all got married at the same time, but now people are having their first kid, maybe even having their second kid. The whole partnership, or if it's a marriage, a marriage has gone from, you know, building this life together to like a baby making, you know, yes. machine. And I know a lot of, of our listeners here can really resonate with that. So I bet a lot of these couples have come to that couples class that you have offered before. What are some of the tools that you work on or share with people when they're coming as a couple to a coaching session or learning session? What we're talking about is really how do we as an individual, you know, it's our, our sort of identity here. Then we became a we, but now the we is getting, it's, complex and you know, there's a lot of sometimes trauma thrown in there and loss. So we're carrying all of this mixed bag of really heavy stuff and we're trying to process it as an individual, but also we're supposed to process it together. And it's that balance of knowing how to do that and how to communicate that. And I think it's really important. I always take time to not sort of jump in and meet people inside their trauma and grief because that's never who they really are. That's who we are inside of trauma and grief. So I wanna to get to know you. Who were you guys before this? Tell me a little bit about how, you know, your childhoods and, and how you met and, and just who you are as people. It's so fascinating. And it's, you know, there's cultural dynamics. There's all sorts of things I like to know about if people are, you know, first generation, second generation. Tell me about your story. So then I get a good, really good lens at the sort of choices they're making and why, what the pressures might be, where they might not have flexibility. And it's fascinating when you hear a lot of that pressure and responsibility people carry. You know, they hear their mom's voice or their grandma's voice or this cultural aspect and the weight of the family that all gets thrown in there. So yeah, we unpack a lot of, a lot of stuff there and it's all important. And I bet the exercise of having couples go through what they were as individuals before and kind of their stories that brought them to the difficult time in their life now I bet it helps them remember why yes. they fell in love and what they liked about each other. And I bet just even hearing that helps them think about themselves again as individual people, not just a woman trying to get pregnant or a partner trying to start a family. I bet just the act of listening and having them revisit that would be really powerful. I think you probably witnessed this too, is that we start to feel like the egg and the sperm. That's it. 
And we start talking like that, you know, how many eggs do we get fertilized day what day two? And no wonder that we sort of lose our identity there and, and things feel very clinical all of a sudden. And the intimacy part of that is really kind of pushed down. Like you said, now we're just the baby making machine with help from these people. And, you know, we're sharing that experience in a in not so intimate way, not the way that we thought this was going to unfold. And it's these, you know, little things that I get people to really try to share because sometimes I think we feel embarrassed of saying, you know, the dream was that we would fall in love and we would, you know, have this amazing life and it would be romantic the way we did this. And <laughs> it's really the opposite. And and people sort of shrug it off like, yeah, I know we're doing it. It's it's it, we need to do it. It's okay. But we always pause and say, but let's just kind of mourn that because mm-hmm. that was important to all of us. And let's just share that. It's not the way you wanted that to unfold. And I'm sorry. Yeah. Any other kind of processes that you would go through to help them if they're having a hard time? I think the communication piece is really important and I find it's really helpful. So we sort of set it up for when we're having a discussion or trying to bridge really big conversations. Can we make it so that the person on the other side knows what you're looking for? Because a lot of times we'll go in looking for comfort because we're feeling really upset and the person comes back with facts and problem solving and fix it. And those two are, you know, totally miss the mark. So one thing I get couples to do is just very simply say, you know, I just really want to share tonight. I don't want to problem solve. I don't want to go through the list. I don't want to think about next steps. And immediately the person that's supporting switches gears and says, oh, a hug. Okay. Yeah. Let's just, you know, relax and have a a snuggle and watch some TV. Perfect. (sighs) Sometimes there's no amount of talking that can get to that. And even something as small as when do we take the phone calls? You know, I have one client that we would literally change that and it was a game, emotional game changer because, you know, the wife said, I always just take them at work by myself. And I said, God, how, how hard is that? That must be really scary. And she says, she kind of just thought about it and said, yeah, it is, you know, to be in a woman, your bathroom stall by yourself on your cell phone is not the best way. So we said, let's say when we get home, that's when we take them, when we're sitting down, when we've had some breath and just, you know, centered ourself. And they tried that. And man, what a, that felt so much better. Absolutely. Yeah. We talked to our patients about that too. You know, they're really sensitive updates that need to come from the clinic, you know, whether it's, you know, how many eggs fertilized or, of course, the pregnancy test result. And we really try to ask people, what do you want? Do you want an email that you could open up together later in the evening when you're both home? Do you want a phone call so that you can ask questions immediately right away? Is there a certain time that we could call? I mean, we can't always do every request, but just even the fact that we're trying and it helps people to think about what they want. I love that you help that person through that because that's a huge burden for her to always get those phone calls, you know, at work and by yourself. I think, yeah, we don't really think of these tiny things that add stress and burden and responsibility. And so when you know, some a client comes in and says, it's all on my shoulders. You know, it's I feel like all the weight is for me to carry. And we kind of say, let's step back and take a look at how we do things. And it's really becomes obvious why that is. And I really love that line. Well, no wonder you feel that way, because that makes sense. You know, the supporter, the husband is usually ready to jump in and sort of waiting, just tell me what to do. I'm here. And so it really is to letting go of a bit of that responsibility and the trust. You know, we have to trust other people in that vulnerable space. So that's a lot of the work is handing that over. Yeah, absolutely. I had a patient just today. We're doing an ultrasound, just a checkup in her IVF cycle, recounting follicles, doing numbers. And I was just going over the result, but I could tell she was really down. I'm like, you know, what's going on? And just waterworks, just tears. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened? thinking something was horrible. And she's just like, well, my partner planned a trip for Italy for three months from now. And I'm like, okay. She's like, but we could be pregnant by then. I'm like, well, yeah. Oh, wait, what? You know, I was just trying to like, and I'm like, oh my gosh. So he is trying to have something to look forward to and to plan this incredible gift, you know, for 
you know, her, this wonderful positive thing. And for her, it felt like he didn't think that they were going to get pregnant because that was like right during the time where when she calculated it out and worked it out with the nursing Mm -hmm. team, that's like the week that she would be doing her embryo transfer, you know? So just the realization, and I just gave her a big hug and I was just like, hey, listen, there's more to this, you know, let's, thank goodness she has a, a counselor she can talk to and like unpack that a little bit. But that's just such a, like an example of just one person trying to take on all of that burden. And eventually you just kind of crumble no matter how strong you are. What looks like hope to one person is not necessarily the same for somebody else. That's one thing that I think I talk to people every day about is the same line of, well, I feel like he's just more hopeful than I am. And my response is always, of course, because he can be. He has the luxury to be. And I think just that reframe of understanding that as women in the physiological aspect of that, we don't get to sort of detach the emotional, the mental, the physical, all of that. When we have a supporter that can, I always say, well, that's great. Mm. Because now they can offer us something that we can't. I get couples a lot to think about, you know, your job in those meetings with doctors and nurses and and practitioners is to just regulate your nervous system and stay breathing and and just keep calm through that. And the spouse can use his brain (laughs) because he can, right? So all the notes and all the questions and all of that stuff is thrown over. And that's such a lovely pairing of what we can do and what's expected. And it's a really great team effort that way. But if you're the guy that's thinking, I can't forget this question and I'm, you know, I'm still in pain and I'm bloated and I'm tired and I'm, I'm having these triggers in this space. Well, no wonder it feels absolutely overwhelming. I worry when couples say, oh, we're not telling anybody else. This is just between me because then they kind of are self-isolating. And then the couple, that one other person is the only person that they're sharing things with. And then what if people process differently? And so as a fertility coach and as someone who's helping them through this trauma and grief, is it a good idea to only tell each other and have only one other person to share with? I think the sharing conversation is something that we have to reflect on really early on. And I often find clients say the first IVF, we told everybody, everybody was rooting for us, you know, that we had this whole cheering section. And then as time kind of goes on, we start to understand that protecting ourselves is really important because the pressure that builds from people asking and checking in and wanting to know starts to feel overwhelming. When it's just each other, I think that's one way to approach it. What we soon realize is that we need more than that because we can't have just one person understanding and comforting and adding support to that space. Let's talk about sex. It really, like the... Intimacy, the sex drive, everything can really get disrupted when you are trying to make a baby. And couples talk about going from a very passionate relationship, really enjoy intimacy together, to after three months, six months, a year of sort of timed intercourse, they are just not finding it to be enjoyable. You must see this in your couples because they talk to me about it. I love that we're talking about that. It needs to be talked more about. And I'm trying to also speak more to the, you know, this piece of just not even just the sexuality, but the freedom and the sensuality and just what that felt like before. And normalizing that when that changes, it's not about you as a couple. And I, that's something I always like to to really make sure people understand is it happens to to really everybody because how could it not? So we have to get a little bit creative in how we think about intimacy, right? And think about the baby making aspect versus just for pleasure aspect. And that takes some time. <laughs> it definitely <laughs> takes some skill because there's just so much going on in that spectrum of things, especially after loss, just the relationship we have with that and our bodies and trying to balance that. So, you know, if we're trying to grieve the loss of something like a pregnancy, that's a complicated space. And it makes sense why we don't feel like we want to really let in people in that space while we're grieving. And that really extends to physical touch sometimes and just 
Yeah, a sensual touch. It's hard to switch gears and switch hats. I've had patients really share with me that they just don't love their bodies anymore, whether it's water weight from bloating from an egg retrieval, whether it's losing a little bit of self-worth or self-trust in their own body because of miscarriages. They just lose that sort of love of their own body for a moment. And I want it to be temporary and I want to help the couples kind of rediscover themselves. Do you talk to anybody about tips for couples that are going through that really very common and difficult part of this journey? Yeah. And I think the first thing that we do is add so much compassion and comfort to that space and try to take the pressure off because it's so much pressure that we're putting on ourselves. One kind of reframe I like to ask is when was the last time, you know, you turned yourself off? And that means it's not so much about us being sexual or, you know, being attracted to our partner inside of this stuff. But what do we say to ourselves that makes us disconnect from our own sensuality and our own connection to that sort of vitality and that space? And that's a really nice question to ask because the critic voice is really loud. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It gets really loud. So when we can start to see, oh yeah, when I'm, you know, thinking of myself in a negative way, no wonder I don't see the value of being with somebody else or or Mm -hmm. see the value of connection with somebody else. So that's an exercise I like to do is we literally list all the things that we find attractive about Mm ourselves, and we reframe those and we make sure we understand why. I've had some patients have real success with redefining intimacy for a little while. So it can be just lying next to each other, you know, whether there's a little bit of touching or not. And if it changes, but just kind of agreeing like, hey, just right now, what I really need is a hug and I just need to be near you, but I don't necessarily want what we typically do for pleasure. And that has relieved in some instances, some of the stress and the burden. Yeah, and the pressure, Mm -hmm. right, of our brain says, oh, if we hug, that might lead to the assumption of, you know, more. And and that's where our brain, especially inside of loss and going through that sort of spaces, we really try to protect that. Mm -hmm. That makes sense why we wouldn't want to be in that space with somebody. I had one other tip from a wonderful nurse practitioner with that I worked with for a long time. And she would tell her patients, and we often shared them, she's like, make different rooms in your home for different things. So like, if you're fortunate enough to have like a guest room or something like that, like make that like the baby making room. And then everything else that happens in your bedroom or your other places in the home, that's intimacy. And I loved that tip too, because there aren't people that necessarily want me to be in charge of their baby making time. Or like do IUIs or things like that. But that mental break has been helpful for some of my patients too. I've heard you share on other podcasts that you might have had your own fertility journey. And I'm just curious how you sought emotional support that you needed through your own journey. Yeah, I did. And, you know, secondary infertility was something that we went through. And in Canada, we have a a pretty good healthcare system. But for the mental health part of it, there's still, you know, when I went through the losses, we still just kind of get sent home. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's wait lists for follow-ups to, you know, women's hospital and those sort of things. But that's sort of where I was sitting in thinking, man, we need to do better than this in the moment of real-time support. And that's why the online community is obviously so wonderful. There's always someone awake somewhere around the world that's sharing or posting something that's inspirational or just wants to connect, you know, whether it's Facebook groups or these online support chats and stuff like that. For anyone that's listening right now that is resonating with all that you're saying and, you know, feeling really stuck, sometimes when you're so low, you don't have the energy to ask for help. For that person, what would you tell them? Well, I love that they're listening because that means they're open and they're thinking about this space. And I would say, you know, when they're ready, I think it will feel like a safe space to speak to somebody in, to keep doing things that feel safe. And and sometimes there's really a one-sided 
you know, Facebook group where you can just lurk and read and, and you don't have to reply or to connect. And if that's the space that you're at, that's amazing. Just do that and see how it feels. Because, yeah, I feel like those people that are really low might just have a really difficult time reaching out, like finding a therapist takes energy, could be on a wait list if they happen to be in Canada. Even reaching out to a coach sometimes can be really intimidating. But just, you're right, you know, get an anonymous account and kind of see other accounts connect with other people because you are not alone. Like there are other people that are feeling the same way. And I feel like that is the biggest piece that's going on in the fertility community is just not allowing people to be alone anymore. Just was always such a shameful place to be. And I think the more that we share our stories, the more uh, we can really, really help each other. I absolutely agree. I think the awareness that is coming out of just being, you know, very vocal about a lot of these campaigns and different, you know, articles. I know that you're such a great advocate for that space of, and I love that you bring humor and you bring <laughs> all of those, that sort of normalizing it, right? I mean, here you are doing this, the really hard job of being a doctor to this space in this community and yet still adding humor and adding the lightness and saying, you know, it doesn't have to be all heavy and serious. I really think that it's important to just keep listening to you know our inner voice and I know as women that's a hard enough job on the daily anyway and inside of this space and that's one thing that grief sure does is it really disrupts that system of trust trusting our body trusting the people around us trusting well we don't know like who do we trust that's kind of the resonation that that we ask so yeah to keep checking in with how that's feeling for us is really the key. Absolutely. Well, Chi, I mean, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate your coming on the show. Where can the listeners find you? You can find me at Misconception Coach and MisconceptionCoach.com. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Chiami as much as I did. We both have so many couples going through this infertility journey together. And I love the actionable items that you can take away from this discussion so that you can not only rediscover yourself, but rediscover why you fell in love with your partner in the first place. I am Dr. Laura Shaheen, and this is Baby or Bust. Baby or Bust is produced by Mark Ramsey, Jamie Solis, and Greg Moga. Executive produced by Paul Anderson and Nick Panella for Workhouse Media. Baby or Bust is a Mark Ramsey Media production.